Jerry Sitzer, we are so excited to welcome you to the sisterhood. It makes me a little nervous to be in the sisterhood. <laughs> Don't be nervous. I'm definitely an intruder. I remember Alex was there. I remember speaking at a MOPS national convention and oh, wow, what an experience that was. <laughs> yep. The only man present. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, I'm, I'm walking into the same set of circumstances. Yeah. <laughs> Dangerous. Well, Jerry, it is truly delightful for me to have you on. I get the privilege and honor of knowing you in real life and we get to live in the same community and intersect in that community. And, um, you've just been a voice of wisdom for me, but why don't you share with everyone just what you've done in the last years and a little bit about your story? Yeah, I uh, just retired from being a professor of theology at Whitworth University, although I'm still working at the institution now as a senior fellow. I'm more an external presence than an internal presence. I speak a lot, write, mentor pastors, that kind of thing. So that occupies some of my time. I still write a lot. And uh, I'm married to Patricia. We have almost 11 grandchildren. Six weeks from now, we will have 11. And get this out of the 11, nine are five and under. So <laughs> needless to say, it's wild. And we live very near all, all but two. And so we see them quite a bit. I've got a large network of friends I spend time with and do some traveling uh, and speaking. So it's a very rich life, but uh, it's a little bit more on my time now, you know, in the working world. We're a little bit more beholden to the requirements of an institution, and now I can cut my own path, which is nice when, when I'm 72 years old. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I uh, grew up in Michigan, married young to a wonderful woman named Linda, and uh, we did our graduate studies and that sort of thing, served the church. I was a chaplain at a university before getting my PhD at the University of Chicago and then came out to Whitworth. In 1989, when I started my position here, and then two years later, my wife died in a drunken driving accident, along with a, a daughter, uh, who was Dinah, uh, Dinah Jane, who was then four, and my mother, who was visiting us for the weekend. So that was a, a really horrific experience. Three of my children survived, and we kind of did life together for 20 years until I remarried. By then, they were all out and gone. Uh, she has two daughters who just uh, 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 amazingly happen to be good friends of my boys. They grew mm -hmm. up together. Krista and I used to be uh, or together on a, a, a trustees of a, of a board and uh, uh, that camp, and they all worked at that camp together. So it's been pretty smooth integrating families. So we have five between the two of us, and they're all married, and they all have children. So it's a very rich life. We're deeply, deeply grateful for it. Mm. Yeah. And we just need to have you back on at some point to talk about your book, A Grace Disguised, which has been truly profound and life changing in countless lives. I'm um, mm -hmm. talking about loss and grief and how to get through something so profoundly life changing um, on this earth. And so that's going to be another conversation, Jerry, because we need to have that conversation at some point. But as you know, today we are diving into this topic of this cultural moment. And this cultural moment feels heavy and hard yes. for a lot of people. And it feels out of control. It feels, I, I often use the metaphor of a very swift river. It feels like a swift river that we're all trying to swim against, but we're losing and it's just taking us downstream and mm -hmm. there's kind of nothing we can do about it. Mm -hmm. That's, I think uh, that's naming a little bit how people are feeling, but can you give us some of your thoughts about just this cultural moment, just even in general of how you are seeing this moment in time? Well, interesting. I just read an article in the Atlantic a couple of uh, days ago, by the way, that's uh, one of the things that I read cover to cover. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a wide range of writers, uh, conservative as well as, as more progressive uh, it's not an ideological magazine. They're just committed to the success of democracy in America, including Christians. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a number of Christian writers. One of uh, self-describes as conservative evangelical. In fact, several are like that. And uh, there was an article in there called Why Have We Become So Stupid? 
<laughs> and uh, it traces what's happened in our American setting uh, in the last 10 to 12 years. He actually uh, pinpoints the year 2009 as a big transition point in American history with the emergence kind of of the dominance of the cell phone and the use of the algorithms mm. uh, when it comes to Twitter and Facebook and, and uh, the internet and so on and so forth. And, and then they go out from there. It's a, it was a very useful way of thinking about what's happened in our culture now. Uh, rates of uh, depression and anxiety have gone through the roof, especially among teens. In fact, there's another Atlantic article I read two days ago about why are our teenagers so sad right now? Mm -hmm. And all the social scientific research indicates they are in a very hard place, mm -hmm. uh, including students who come from a, a white middle, upper middle class backgrounds. It's not simply those that are poor. I mean, it reflects right. the rich in a very different way, but it still do does. In their case, their sense of pressure on them to perform and to excel is overwhelming. So, um, you know, we have that, we have the deep polarization in American society, we all feel that. Um, uh, another interesting trend is um, um, suspicion of institutions. Uh, so mm -hmm. social theorists, uh, Robert Putnam is a, a guy to read too. He uh, wrote the groundbreaking book, Bowling Alone, about 25 years mm -hmm. ago. And he just came out with his magnum opus um, um, called The Upside. Uh, is that it? Yeah, I think so. And uh, he, he talks about the decline of what he and sociologists call mediating institutions in American society. So my favorite example is to look at a group of men and now women who are in business and, and so on and ask them how many belong to the Rotary. <laughs> and yeah, a few hands go up. Mm -hmm. 40 years ago, almost every hand would have gone up. It's true. How many go to the Y for programs? How many are in Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts? I mean, uh, the dominance of churches in communities has uh, fairly declined, except when we have a kind of consumer attitude. I mean, across the board, all of those institutions that stand between big government, big political parties, and so on, and the individual have all suffered significant erosion. So we don't connect with people. We don't belong anymore. Uh, we don't have a village uh, to raise our kids and to make decisions and to invest in communities to make a difference. And what that's done is it's tended to turn uh, politics into our religion. Hmm. And politics is a really bad religion. Gosh. We all need to be political and involved in some, to some degree, but we can't expect from politics what we can only expect from God. Mm -hmm. And when we turn politics into God, we're in serious trouble. So there's a lot going on right now in the American landscape, and it's creating a lot of confusion and suspicion and depression and anxiety and anger. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, I'm, I'm not on Twitter at all, uh, but uh, I've seen just enough on Facebook to see how incredibly nasty people are to each other, mm -hmm. and uh, including Christians. Yeah, the bar has gotten so low as far as how people communicate with each other. And yeah, Twitter, I used to be on Twitter a lot. <laughs> I've pulled back because I don't feel like anything productive is happening anymore. It used to be a place for conversation and now it's a place for zinger sound bites. It feels like. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's made now for any people uh, who are Enneagram eights, if you know anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, we do. Personalities. We had a guest on uh, Whitworth's campus last week. Uh, her name is Kristen Dumay. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. She's a book called Jesus and John Wayne. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that thing has gone viral. I mean, she gets invitations all the time. She gets letters, multiple letters every day. And she's gone on Twitter because she's small and sweet, petite, big smile, but she's an Enneagram 8. And oh my gosh, you do not want to tangle with this woman. And she said <laughs> the nastiness that she experiences is simply indescribable, which kind of reinforces what her argument is. You know? mm -hmm. Well, so it is. And, and you, Jesus. 
in all this. Sorry. Yeah. And looking, going back to the Atlantic article in that comment that you just made, why are we disconnected? Why are we depressed? Why, you know, because when you are putting yourself out in the arena, you're just getting pummeled in the arena. I mean, she's in the arena and she's just getting hit, 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 hit time and time again. Yeah. And you, and then we wonder why we're struggling. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Krista, how long have we known each other? This is a good example. You're not a close friend of mine, <clears throat> but we have overlapping circles and there's connection there. I've known your kids. I spoke at a couple of family camps where you were there. I know your husband. So even in our case, when we don't have dinner every week together, there's still con connection. Right, right. <clears throat> and Absolutely. so many people don't have that. Social, uh, social psychologists, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> have done a number of, um, uh, they use research tools to get at these issues. And one of the questions they ask is, if you were in an emergency room, how many people could you immediately call to get picked up? Mm -hmm. And a surprisingly large number of Americans say, I have no one. Wow. Uh, my good, dear, dear friend, Ron Pilo, lost his wife six years ago to cancer, did grief share at a church. I think there were 16 or 18 people who participated, having all suffered loss. And he said he was the only person there that had deep connection and relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's heartbreaking, isn't it? It's is heartbreaking. It, 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 heartbreaking. And, and so that's why we're here partly because our listeners have asked for this conversation to say, right. how do we move forward? Mm -hmm. How do we do something different? And your newest book is titled Resilient Faith. Why is resilience what you're pointing to? And why is that something that we need right now when we are considering this cultural landscape you just described? Yeah, yeah thank you, Alex. Um, well, the subtitle tells it all, uh, how the early Christian quote, in quotes, third way changed the world. So it's on early Christianity, an accessible book on this fantastic story. One sociologist says, there's never been in the history of the world, a social movement, that flourished for so many years under difficult circumstances. Uh, let's just say the Christian movement was born in the year 40 and before the first quote Christian emperor assumed the throne of Rome in 310, that's 270 years. And it started as a small sect within Judaism in Jerusalem. And by the time uh, the first Christian emperor assumed the throne, the Christian movement had over 5 million people. And they figured out how to organize. They figured out how to do life in a way that left an impression on their communities. They figured out how to care for the least of these. They figured out how to worship, how to build community, how to plant and grow churches, how to develop leaders and disciples, all without any form of state support. In fact, it was the opposite. They faced a lot of state opposition. I mean, what a story. And my argument is that we need to learn from those movements that did not enjoy cultural establishment privilege. Mm. We're not sort of on the winning side of, of, uh, of a cultural moment, but had to face, um, uh, well, as you put it, Krista, they were swimming upstream in a culture that was moving fast in a very different direction. And they pulled it off. 207 years is a long period of time. That's more years than going back to our Declaration of Independence. So I think this is a movement we can learn a lot from. And that's why I wanted to write that book. Uh, they were known as the third way or third race. The first was the Roman way of traditional religion. The second was Judaism. And Christianity was so unique and maintained that uniqueness for such a long period of time that Roman officials didn't know what to call it. Hmm. I mean, obviously Christianity, but they didn't know how to make sense of it. And so they called it a third way, not hmm. Roman, not Jewish, but something different. Clearly set apart from the cultural mainstream and yet immersing itself in the culture and going everywhere, famous late century uh, writer, uh, Tertullian was his name. He was actually a lawyer, a, a, an adult convert, uh, said, 
uh, kind of half cynically to a Roman official, you find us everywhere, but in your temples. Hmm. Everywhere. See, it spread. Mm -hmm. And it exercised huge influence. So there, there's a pot, there's there's a movement that we can study and learn a lot from. Yeah. Well, and it is, I I really find this comforting because mm -hmm. I think as people are looking at, well, this is new. We haven't had this before. We haven't experienced this before, but it's not new. It's mm -hmm. just new to us in our lifetime, Correct. but it's not new when we look at the history of the church. And that's where I think your voice is so important because nope, this isn't new. And in fact, it actually is in this time, in this third way time that it exploded and that there's something about the pressure and there's something about the narrowing margin of cul of culture not supporting that creates something beautiful in the church. So mm -hmm. can you speak to that dynamic? Uh, yeah, I can, uh, Krista. Again, uh, these are such great, uh, great questions. Um, uh, I argue that um, there were two alternatives that the church faced in the early Christian period that would have been really attractive to them. Uh, the first way would be the way of accommodation. In order to win Rome's favor, uh, you just accommodate to the culture and to cultural norms. Uh, that would make the way easier for the Christian movement. Uh, using your analogy, maybe they don't swim against the stream. They don't go with the stream, but they kind of go sideways. Mm -hmm. But sideways means they're still being swept down the river. <laughs> yeah. And um, that would have pleased Rome. Rome was highly absorptive as a culture. They kept absorbing new religions, new peoples, new movements but it was all under the one uh, condition uh, that, that they would be subservient to Rome, just to Rome as kind of an idea and an ideal. And the Christians refused to accommodate. They maintain their distinctive identity in spite of the pressure to accommodate in order to win Rome's favor. The other way was isolation. In order to maintain their own kind of uniqueness, they have to withdraw from the culture and build kind of alternative cultures that simply remain separate from the larger culture. And both of those, you'll notice, we're practicing uh, quite successfully today. Mm -hmm. In the case of accommodation, we'll do that when it comes to woke culture or when it comes to conservative politics. We have lots of examples of that right now or when it comes to prosperity gospel. On the other hand, we have groups that wanna simply withdraw from society, build their Christian schools, stay within their own Christian groups, yeah. uh, their own Christian businesses so that they just lose the capacity to engage with the larger culture, to somehow understand the language, the metaphors, the practices, but in a way that uh, enables them or allows them uh, to make good gospel witness in those settings. So th this is a very narrow pathway, but they did it and we can too. In fact, I'm gonna say that I'm actually pre pretty optimistic right now. And here's the reason why. Never in American history, except maybe in the early 19th century, never in American history have we had more open doors of opportunity before us. And the reason why is most other institutions that were our partners or competitors are shriveling. Mm -hmm. So here we are with the church, with the gospel, with community, with a set of values and practices that people desperately need but don't know anything about. And we keep accommodating to the culture instead of setting a course that shows this is a different team, a different message, a different way of life. If we did that with even a certain degree of modest commitment, we would, we would find a lot of interested people. I mean, just think, Alex, you know, you're, you've been involved in MOPS. Think about what it's like to raise a child right now. I mean, we have almost 11 grandchildren. And I'll tell you, it is hard for these parents. They don't mm -hmm. see a lot of allies in the larger culture. But the church is an ally. Uh, so I think we we have not for a long, long time had opportunity like we have right now, if we're willing 
to return to the life and witness and example and grace of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the gospel stands. It's it stands today in the middle of the chaos, and like Krista said, we we're all living our our own lives that that last what maybe eighty years, eighty five years long, and so we only have the lived experience that we have, and yet it's so helpful to remember that we are part of God's big story, oh, and that His people yes. have have gone through something quite similar to this over and over and over again. And that this is the Christian life. This Mm -hmm. is in fact, what we are called to, to not completely isolate, to not completely assimilate, but to do a third way. And it is, as Krista said, so comforting to remember, or even maybe to be hearing this for the first time, that we are not the first Christians to be walking this road in a cultural mix that feels so foreign to us mm-hmm. and that maybe we can actually harness that feeling and it can help us remember that this is not our home, mm-hmm. that we are ushering in a new kingdom, God's kingdom, because this place that we are living, that we are occupying is broken. So yeah, the early Christian period, uh, uh, it initially reached Jews. And the advantage of Jews is e- even though uh, they were hostile to the, the kind of Messiah Jesus ended up being, they knew the story. They had the categories, creation, fall, redemption, God's involvement in history, and so on. So once they were converted, they kind of carried their Jewish background with them into the faith. But when they began to reach Gentiles, real, real pagans in the Roman world, the gap between them and the Christian message and lifestyle was enormous. It was like a Grand Canyon, you couldn't jump across it. And so they created a tool they called the catechumenate. Uh, It was a two to three year process that would move people to a life of established faith, to real discipleship. Two to three years. It would require a mentor. They would have a kind of curriculum that, uh, that involved the Christian story. Christian doctrine, simple Christian doctrine, a Christian way of life. Uh, They were expected not simply to think like a Christian or believe like a Christian, but to act like a Christian. And then after that two to three year process, they would go through the rites of initiation. That is uh, baptism, confirmation, their first Eucharist, and they'd become official church members. Well, I want to suggest to you that we're going to have to rediscover and implement something like that process again. Mm-hmm. We can't assume as much as we used to. Um, the, 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 the familiarity that people have in our larger culture with Christianity is, uh, has been significantly eroded and, uh, and, and twisted, not just eroded, but twisted, perverted. And so we're probably going to have to start back farther. <clears throat> Typical churches have a new members class that might be a Thursday night and a weekend. We probably are going to need to turn that into something that's more like two years long. Mm-hmm. Not heavy handed, not legalistic. Yeah. We don't want to create fundamentalist Christians. We want to create uh, or nurture followers of Jesus. There's a church. I developed something like this called the New Catechumen a couple of years ago. And some churches are starting to use it now. There's a church in Iowa. Uh, This is a Dutch reformed community. It's a very large church, about 3000 people. And they've decided that over the next five years, they want everyone to go through this. Really? Mm -hmm. How do people get a hold of that, Jerry? Uh, They can contact me through my Whitworth email address. You know, we did, we did some pilots and now it's starting to get out there. It's a church in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, a Presbyterian church in this case. Uh, that that's using it, trying to train leaders and kind of reintroduce the fullness of the Christian faith. But our motto is not information, but formation. Yeah. We don't want to drown them in more information. We want mm-hmm. them to learn the way of Jesus. Jesus is not only the way to life through his death and resurrection. Jesus is also the way of life. Mm-hmm. And both both are equally true and important. So I'm assuming that within this curriculum, there's a lot of handholds and I'm wondering if you can just touch on some of those. Cause I, my question immediately is going to the practical, 
like, okay, I get it. Like third way I'm in, I'm in for the third way. I want to be a part of that movement. Yeah. What does that mean? What does that mean? Because I, I don't really know how to do this. And so can you speak to a little bit of that way forward in some of the I, practicals? Yeah. Well, there. Are, uh, t- uh, l- let me start with a kind of quote curriculum. I mean, it's only it's only thirty two half hour videos, mm-hmm. um, and uh, that introduces you to kind of the larger uh, categories. Uh, we I break it down into believing, belonging, and behaving. So believing has to do with kind of the basic Christian story, basic Christian doctrines, uh, what faith is, so on and so forth, obedience. Uh, belonging has to do with the community of faith and then behaving has to do with how we live it out in daily life. So that's kind of how it's broken down. Mm -hmm. Oh, we've got, I've got one presentation on writing a rule of life, another one on developing a healthy rhythm of life. Mm. So, so forth, generosity, uh, justice, evangelism. Um, The other thing is that it's, uh, it has to be done in a small group. Uh, a church has to buy into it. It can't just be an individual. So it's community oriented and it's based, uh, there's some homework involved in that kind of thing, but there's always a spiritual exercise that they experiment with for two to four weeks. Um, so they're kind of, they're experiencing the larger, the, the way the church has practiced faith over 2000 years, much of which has been lost to us. That's one thing. And there's also a special project that work on that uh, every session that moves it into just normal life. As I like to say, discipleship has to do with the kind of person you are when you're not doing religion. (laughs) That's good. So I put it this way. If a detective were put on your tail for two weeks and you didn't know it, you would look recognizably Christian all the time. Mm. So that has to do with how you steward your resources, how you treat your kids, how you, uh, what kind of neighbor you are, how you practice medicine, how you coach your kids in soccer or basketball, uh, all the things, uh, all the points of contact we have with the larger world. So I want to introduce people to think about that way of life that's based on the way of Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. Mm. So, I mean, one little practice is I have them learn how to walk their neighborhood by praying. So when they walk their neighborhood with their spouse or friend, a partner, uh, they're, they're looking around and they're walking and praying at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're, they're being prepared <clears throat> for the kinds of encounters that God's going to bring their way. God's already in the neighborhood. He's already at work. They don't need to do anything but step in the work that God is already doing. Mm. And so I remember when the pandemic first struck and we, everything was shut down. It was spring, as you recall. And Patricia and I started walking uh, more and more in the neighborhood. I cannot tell you the number of people we met. Really? The stories we heard. And I looked at Patricia and I kept saying, oh my gosh, God's already at work here. And she would look at me and go, duh, of course <laughs> God's already at work. We need to train our eyes to see it and step into it. Well, that's a practice. Mm-hmm. Same with your place at work. God's there. He's not simply at church. He's everywhere. He's ubiquitous. He's God. Anyway. So I was just I want people to practice faith. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. I w- well, I was, I'm meeting with some high school girls and just last night we were saying that very thing. And we were talking about how <clears throat> when you're in the market to buy a white car, all of a sudden white cars come out of nowhere and you're like, oh my gosh, I never knew there were so many white cars on the road, but look at there's one. Now there's one. Okay. I like that one. I like that one. And it's, it is truly the same idea. When we are looking for God, we start seeing him everywhere. Exactly. But but when we're not, we don't. Yeah, that's right. I remember we had, um, uh, Linda and I had trouble uh, conceiving. So we went many years before we had our first child. She was 34 when she had her first baby. And uh, she would say to me, why is it in wanting to get pregnant? I see pregnant women everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And the five years before that, I didn't see them anywhere. Mm -hmm. Same principle. Mm -hmm. We got to look for God. So that's one of many, many practices. Uh, even when it comes to the Trinity, I try to make the Trinity practical. I mean, it better be. Anyway, so my point is, is that in early Christianity, they created a tool, a process that created one generation after another of a functional Christian. And that allowed the movement to grow without excessive accommodation or assimilation, Alex, as you put it, to the culture. Hmm. And uh, it grew more slowly than we would like. Um, if you look at the numbers, it was about a 40% per decade growth rate over 270 years to go from 5,000 people in the year 40 to 5 million in the year 300. Um, so that's not a mega church growth, but it's solid, steady growth. Mm. Not a fast growing tree, but then you get an oak at the end of it <clears throat> and not something that's going to survive for 25 years and then fall down. Mm -hmm. deeper root system and I think that's what we need to concentrate on yeah can I ask you a question about um I don't know how to phrase this as believers we have to trust that God is already at work he hasn't he's not dormant he hasn't gotten to sleep on us and yet there are you're talking about things we can do to help um disciple if mm -hmm. you will, uh, fellow Christians or ourselves, even as wow. we're growing in our own faith, what is the role of trusting the Holy spirit to do its work in the world? And what is the responsibility that we take on as believers? Cause I think a lot of us feel this sense of responsibility, like it's up to us. Mm -hmm. And then we re remind each other, well, actually God is still kind of in charge. How do we operate in that tension yeah. of knowing that God is in charge and yet knowing he calls us and we are his hands and feet. Mm -hmm. Well, you use the word tension. That would be the word that I would use is we have to live in a tension between human responsibility and divine initiative. And one does not eliminate the other. The best analogy I can come up with would be um, a basketball player or a golfer that hits the zone. And uh, you see them out there and they can't miss three. Uh, they hit 31 free throws uh, in a row. Uh, they see the court like they've never seen before, a baseball player that is swinging at a ball that looks like a beach ball, uh, or a pianist who is uh, performing before an audience, and she feels like she's just stepped into another world. Now, I believe that all of that, there, there's a kind of quality that surprises the athlete or the musician that's beyond what they could have done. But behind that was lots of skills, lots of scales they practiced, lots of hard work. So the one does not exclude the other. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit should never be seen as an excuse for, for laziness and an unwillingness to practice and learn. Having said that, the opposite is no better. It's all on me. It's all because of me. It's all the work I put into it because we're stepping into a world that's animated by the life of God through the Holy Spirit. And when we do that, things are going to happen. We simply could not have engineered or pulled off, pulled off ourselves. So that's the role of spiritual formation, that we are doing what the athlete did or the musician did to Correct. prepare ourselves for that moment trusting that the Holy Spirit's going to meet us there yeah. and that we will be well equipped because of the things that we have done to equip ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. It's both and not either or. Yeah. I have a question, a follow-up question to that about raising children in this, in this cultural moment. And that is that our kids really are being raised to want things to be easy, immediate results. I mean, it's just the state of our, it, it just is what it is because of technology, because of what we've got at our fingertips, they're being raised to not want to do the work in a lot of ways. And so what word do you have for parents who are trying to kind of infuse this third way into their families? Uh, again, I think about this all the time, Krista, first, because I was a parent and uh, for 
for so many years and still am, by the way. Yes. I mean, your role changes, but man, I, we've got 10 children uh, mm -hmm. or, or in-laws all in their 30s. All mm -hmm. 10 are in their 30s. And they all have young children. What a challenge they face. So this is on my mind a lot. Mm -hmm. um, oh boy, that is such a big and hard uh, question. Um, yeah, rephrase it for me. I mean, but, but I, I, yeah. I need to get a beat on this a little bit better. Yeah, and, and it is, and I'm not sure there's like clear answers. I would just love a little bit of your wisdom on you know, as we are raising children, so we're struggling to do this ourselves, right? Yeah. We're struggling to find that balance of spiritual practices that we're struggling to uphold in our own individual lives and letting the spirit move. And I heard you say it's a both and, mm -hmm. and then we're also trying to raise children who have their own free will, <laughs> dang it, mm -hmm. have their own free will. And they are struggling to create healthy patterns in their lives. And I know your grandkids are young, but I'm seeing this right in my teenagers and now emerging young adults that they're struggling to create healthy rhythms and patterns in their own lives. And so I guess my question is, you know, prayer is one of our roles. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. I believe that is a way forward. And mm -hmm. that probably is the way forward mm -hmm. um, for parents, but do you have any other wisdom, I guess, um, for those of us? Well, I'm not sure I do. I mean, I'm still learning myself here and still failing. I, I will say this, though, Krista, that we need to ask the question, how will I judge what a successful job as a parent is? So good. And I'll tell you what, that's going to force us to face ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're clamoring to always get the best coach for our kids and always get them into the best schools and the best teachers behind that is the motivation. I want my child to be a success as the world defines success. And there is a lot of research on this for people like us, white, middle, upper middle-class people is our ambition for our children has really gone sideways from the kingdom of God. Now, of course, I want my kids to get a college education if their inclination is in that direction. But for a lot of parents, if their child chose to be a carpenter instead of uh, going to, uh, to Whitworth or University of Washington or Harvard uh, in order to become an MD or a lawyer or something like that, or a financial advisor, they failed, no. So we have to ask, what, what's the criteria for success? Okay, well, you mentioned the word resilience. That's not on people's lips. We know that our children are not resilient. We need to ask what will help me raise a resilient child. Well, that means, Krista, that if they have a disappointing coach, we keep, keep them on the team. Mm -hmm. And they learn how to negotiate a coach that they think is, quote, unfair mm -hmm. and is not giving him or her enough playing time. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or a teacher in the fourth grade that is not particularly kind or isn't attentive to our child. It doesn't mean we never pull them from the class, but we always ask a different set of questions. How can I help my child respond wisely and maturely to a set of circumstances that are not to my or their liking? That's mm -hmm. what builds resilience. You don't have resilience at the age of 40. You start building it when you're five or mm -hmm. 10. I remember maybe Three months after the accident, I was having conversation with a young student, pretty mature student. And he came in and began to sob because his girlfriend, and he had just been dating her for a month, broke up with him. Part of me wanted to say, do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> yeah. But another part of me said, wait a minute, Jerry. <clears throat> He's building the soul muscle right now to be able to handle what I had to face when I was 40. Mm. And we need to back up and not do it at 20, but at five. But that is a question again about what criteria am I using to judge my success as a parent? And is it getting my kids into Harvard? Mm -hmm. So there was another Atlantic article, uh, oh, maybe eight years ago, astonishingly persuasive argue, uh, article about what they called the 9.9%. .9%. 
Okay, so the 0.01% or no, the 0.1% are the super rich. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, we're talking about not upper middle class, but at another category altogether. Uh, the next category, they're called the 9.9%. These are people who are highly well-to-do. They think they're middle class and they're not. Mm -hmm. And I was really curious about this. And I asked uh, Patricia, okay, where would you put us? Would we be in the 9.9%? And she said, no, we would not be in the 9.9%. So I said, where would you put us? And then I guess too, they had a scale that they use and guess what? You were in the 9.9%. <laughs> oh my gosh. And not even on the, uh, not even on the, on the boundary line. Okay. And then they studied their value system and here's one of their strongest orientations. They have a high ambition to make their children successful. Mm. The reason why they don't like affirmative action is because they have white children and they want their children to experience preferential treatment. Yep. <laughs> okay, I mean, let's face it. Yeah. Well, that goes back again to ask the same question. What is, does it mean? What criteria do I use to determine what it is to be a successful parent? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, once you do that, then from there you back up and say, okay, what am I gonna be doing now to help my child become that kind of child. Maybe it means you go on a mission trip when they're eight years old. Or uh, who do you have over at your house? Who are their friends? How do you function in the neighborhood? And on it goes. Is mm -hmm. the group gonna take priority or their AAU team? Mm -hmm. There's, there's all, a tension right there, Jerry. Those are all ouchy questions. They sure are. Yeah. They sure are. Uh, that is very helpful. Thank you for that. And I, I find that to be very helpful and a so great I, reminder. A little ironic uh, anecdote here. So I, I took my kids. I'm no model here, by the way. I wasn't a perfect parent and my kids would be the first ones to tell you that. Mm -hmm. um, but I took my kids on a, a trip to Africa for a whole summer. Uh, Catherine was 17, David was 15, and John was 11. And I taught at a university, uh, uh, Daystar in Kenya, we were in Kenya. Uh, we lived on campus, the bigger campus was the rural campus, the smaller campus was the urban. And uh, it was beautiful, we were right in the Savannah and uh, we had a lot of African students over. Uh, we were the only white person there. Hmm. And my kids two days a week did volunteer work in a Mother Teresa orphanage for disabled children in the middle of the largest slum in the world at that time, Kabir, uh, Kabir slum. What an experience. Imagine an 11 year old kid doing mm. that all day long. Mm -hmm. Well, my son, David was a runner and he was a good runner. As you know, Christy, you know him well enough to know. He was on four state championship teams and that sort of thing. And we, uh, we lost a season or a summer of training. Ironically, a week after we were there, he met an African who was a runner and they worked out together for the summer in rural Africa. Mm. Interestingly enough, I'm still in touch with that, well, young man, not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> he was a refugee from Liberia. He had a flea when the civil war broke out and he's never seen his family since. Wow. They were all killed. Well, imagine my son running with that man for the summer. Yeah. Not about running, is it? It's about a much larger world that he was exposed to. Mm -hmm. So he didn't really lose that summer, did he? Well, and what is your son doing now, Jerry? Right. Working with uh, special needs adults, right? Started his own organization. Mm -hmm. And you think about the investment you made then that has shaped, that shaped his calling now. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. That. That's quite a story. Mm -hmm. mm. Now, again, I'm going to quick to say, I didn't do everything right here, guys. <laughs> mm -hmm. <clears throat> We're all stumbling along and being, and being <laughs> we sure are teaching each other. I mean, carrying on conversations, being in a small group of parents who are raising their children together. That's another thing that we can do too, because it kind of keeps our ship heading in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, in a community of faith who are committed to the same things we are under God. 
Right. It's that multifaceted approach. Yeah. And different right. parts of your life are affirming other parts of your life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that your kids can say that you lived an honest faith, that you lived a holistic faith and not just, you know, if that private investigator was following you around for two weeks, there would be evidence that, mm. um, that your faith is real to you. And so for that parent who's listening and thinking, I can't take my kids to Africa. Oh no. <laughs> what am I going to do? That, mm. that wasn't the point of your story. The point is that all of these elements we need to be asking, what are we exposing our kids to and with what attitude and how do we have these different aspects of our lives continually pointing to yeah. Jesus as savior. Yeah. And yeah, it's, um, and Jesus as Lord. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, we're not raising professional athletes anyway, nor geniuses. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm we're not raising ordinary people because we're ordinary. That's right. And the sooner we can grasp that very statement, we are just ordinary people, the better off we're going to be because <laughs> everyone's trying yeah. to be special. That's oh, right. Gosh. Except it's in the ordinariness that we become extraordinary. I mean, the, the, oh. the, the ironies of it all mm-hmm. is the, the, the simplicity and extraordinariness of just living for God in the dailiness of life. Mm-hmm. It dignifies the ordinary. I mean, God became human and Jesus, the son of God lived in such ordinariness uh, and obscurity that the gospel writers didn't have anything to say about it. Imagine that. They didn't ignore it. There was nothing to say. Yeah. I worked in a carpenter shop. He showed up in the synagogue. (laughs) Mm -hmm. He was a a sibling, probably helped raise his siblings after his father died. Not much there. Mm. That's the son of God. Mm -hmm. Mm. Such a good word. And your life is that, Jerry. So thank you for being someone that I look to as being that in the world. Thank you for that. Well, Ooh, thank you. get teary. Okay. <laughs> so as we're closing out, um, what, a, just, what's your last bit of encouragement to people who are living in this cultural moment? What, what would you say is kind of uh, your charge to them? I have a historical illustration. So, uh, if you Google, uh, and write down what's the worst year in world history, the kind of uh, unofficial consensus is the year 536, which you've never heard of before. None of us have. So the Roman Empire was uh, in serious decline. The city of Rome had gone from about a million people in the year 300 to between 35 and 50,000 by the year 500. Think about that decline. And that was true of urban centers across the Mediterranean world. Tribal invasions were spilling over onto all the, uh, uh, into the entire empire. Sometimes it was a smoother process. Sometimes it was warfare. So we have all that. Then in the year 536, there was a series of volcanic explosions in Iceland. And it literally encircled the entire globe in darkness for for 18 months. A comet hit in Australia and only exacerbated the problem. Mm. There's historical evidence from literally around the world that Everyone remembers the year 536 as the year of darkness. Hmm. Well, that set off massive starvation around the entire globe. Well, then in the year 540, the first bubonic plague broke out and afflicted both the Middle East and Europe with uh, in extraordinarily high death rates, not as bad as the Black Death of uh, the 14th century, but historians estimate millions and millions of people died. Hmm. Okay, that's a bad year, right? There. <laughs> yeah. It was catastrophic. It was it was beyond imagination. And of course, they didn't even have any of the information, you know, no CNN, no internet to say there's a volcanic expl- explosion in Iceland. Hmm. It was the year of darkness followed by the first terrible, terrible bubonic plague. Well, <clears throat> there was a man uh, who had been raised in an arist- aristocratic home in Rome or outside Rome, it was rural, but he, very wealthy, went to Rome for education, became very disillusioned with the worldliness of the church and life, withdrew uh, into a cave to seek the face of God. He attracted some disciples. He experimented with a kind of communal way of life. It bombed. He withdrew again, tried again, and this time it succeeded. He wrote a rule of life for this group of people, and by the end of his life, 
there were 12 communities of 12 people each. Mm -hmm. 12 times 12 is 144 people. If a pastor left behind at the end of his or her career, a, a church of 144 people, he'd probably or she probably consider himself a failure. All right, well, that, were, that was the beginning of the Benedictine way of life, Benedictine monasticism. And over the course of the next three to 500 years, it literally picked Western uh, civilization up on its shoulders and carried it. Hmm. Benedictine communities became the pharmacies in the Middle Ages, the hospitals of the Middle Ages, the motels of the Middle Ages. They experimented with agricultural and animal husbandry. They provided education. They copied all a lot of classical ancient books as well as the church fathers. They held them in libraries. I mean, you go on and on. There is no parallel institution we have today to the dominance of monasteries for 600 years. Wow. And if we had been living in the year, yeah, Benedict died in 547, so right after these disasters, if we had been alive in 547, we wouldn't have seen what he was doing because it was too small. Mm. small Amen. is beautiful if it's faithful to God. Yeah, my gosh. Raising little families, participating in little churches that are really committed to a life of discipleship, imbued by grace, imbued by grace. And we do this in our neighborhoods and in our churches and in our medical practices and in our podcasts really, really devoted to the way of Jesus, imbued by grace. I think I've said that before. Uh, we're the next little Benedictine experiment. Mm. Now that brings hope to me. It mm -hmm. sure does. It really does. Well, thank you, Jerry. This has been such a life-giving conversation from start to finish. And I love ending well, on that note. Thank you. You are good, good people. And I thank God for you. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Jerry. Bye. Bye-bye.